What's up guys? It's Matt here back for another edition of Every Day in the Word. Looking forward to getting back in the book of Joshua here together with you to see Joshua split the land up for the people of Israel. I know it seems kind of crazy for us to be reading this uh, thousands and thousands of years later um, if the land doesn't really matter necessarily to your life right now. But this is important for us to understand and important for us to know if we want to understand the whole context of the Old Testament narrative. Uh, so open up to Joshua chapter 15. We're going to be reading this big long chapter, just with this one chapter today, um, to learn about the people of Judah, um, which is a very important tribe of Israel, as you know. So chapter 15 of Joshua, we're going to start it right now. Chapter 15. The allotment for the tribe of the people of Judah, according to their clans, reached southward to the boundary of Edom, to the wilderness of Zin at the farthest south. And their south boundary ran from the end of the Salt Sea, from the bay that faces southward. It goes out southward of the ascent of the Kremlin, passes along to Zin, and goes up south of Kadesh Barnea, along by Ezra. Up to Edard, turns about to Karka, passes along to Asmon, goes out by the brook of Egypt, and comes to its end of the sea. This shall be your south boundary, and the east boundary is the Salt Sea, to the mouth of the Jordan. And the boundary on the north side runs from the bay of the sea at the mouth of the Jordan. And the boundary goes up to Beth Hoglah, and passes along the north of Beth Arabah. And the boundary goes up to the stone of Bohan, the son of Reuben. And the boundary goes up to Deber, from the valley of Achor, and so northward, turning toward Gilgal, which is opposite the ascent of Adom, which is on the south side of the valley. And the boundary passes along to the waters of Enchemish, and ends at Enrogel. Then the boundary goes up by the valley of the son of Hinnom, at the southern shoulder of the Jebusite, that is Jerusalem. And the boundary goes up to the top of the mountain that lies over against the valley of Hinnom on the west, at the northern end of the valley of Rephaim. Then the boundary extends from the top of the mountain to the spring of the waters of Nephtoa, and from there to the cities of Mount Ephron. Then the boundary bends around to Bala, that is Kiriath Jerim. And the boundary circles west of Bala to Mount Seir, passes along to the northern shoulder of Mount Jerim, that is Kesalon, and goes down to Beth Shemesh, and passes along by Timnah. The boundary goes out to the shoulder of the hill north of Ekron, then the boundary bends around to Shikaron, and passes along to Mount Bala, and goes out to Jebniel. Then the boundary comes to an end of the sea. And the west boundary was the great sea with its coastline. This is the boundary around the people of Judah, according to their clans. According to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, he gave to Caleb the son of Jephunneh a portion among the people of Judah, Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron. Arba was the father of Anak. And Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak, Shishai, and Hyman, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak. And he went out from there against the inhabitants of Deber. Now the name of Deber formerly was Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, Whoever strikes Kiriath Sefer and captures it, to him will I give Axah my daughter his wife. And Othniel the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, captured it. And he gave him Axah his daughter his wife. When she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. And she got off her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Give me a blessing, since you have given me the land of the Negev. Give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the people of Judah, according to their clans. The cities belonging to the tribe of the people of Judah in the extreme south toward the boundary of Edom were Kabziel, Eder, Jager, Kaina, Dimona, Hadadah, Kedesh, Hazor, Ithnan, Ziph, Telam, Beloth, Hazor, Hadadah, Kiriath Hezron, that is Hazor, Amam, Shema, Moada, Hazar Gada, Heshmon, Beth Pilat, Hazar Shual, Yeshiva, Biziothiah, Bela, Ayam, Ezem, Altoled, Kiesel, Horma, Ziklag, Madmana, Sansana, Babaoth, Shilam, Ayan, and Rimon, in all twenty-nine cities with their villages, and in the lowland, Ashdeal, Zora, Ashna, Zanoah, and Ganem, Tapua, Enam, Jarmuth, Adullam, Soko, Azika, Jeraim, Adathaim, Gadira, Gadarathaim, fourteen cities with their villages, Zenan, Adisha, Migdalgad, Dilion, Mizpah, Jokthiel, Lakish, Bozkath, Eglon, Kaban, Lamam, Kitlish, Kadiroth, Bethdagon, Naama, and Nikita, sixteen cities with their villages, Libna, Ether, Ashan, Iftah, Ashna, Nizab, Kiala, Aksib, and Marisha, nine cities with their villages. Ekron with its towns and its villages, from Ekron to the sea, all that were by the side of Ashdod with their villages. Ashdod its towns and its villages, Gaza its towns and its villages, to the brook of Egypt and the great sea with its coastline, and in the hill country, Shamir, Jadar, Soko, Dana, Kiryatsana, that is Deber, Anab, Eshtemo, Anim, Goshen, Holon, and Gilo, eleven cities with their villages. Arab, Duma, Ishan, Jenim, Beth Tafua, Afika, Umta, Kiryath Arba, that is Hebron, and Zior, nine cities with their villages. Mayon, Carmel, Ziph, Jada, Jezreel, Jogdiam, Zanoah, Cain, Gibeah, and Timnah, ten cities with their villages. Alvul, Beth Zur, Gidor, Meirath, Beth Anoth, and Eltakon, six cities with their villages. Kiriath Baal, that is Kiriath Jerim, and Rabbah, two cities with their villages. In the wilderness, Beth Arabah, Midin, Sikeka, Nipshan, the city of Salt, and in Gedai, six cities with their villages. But the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the people of Judah could not drive out. So the Jebusites dwell with the people of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. All right, awesome. So uh, the people of Judah get a big plot of land. God really cares about this tribe of Israel. Um, obviously, this is the tribe that uh, David comes from, um, so that means all of the kings of Israel come from the tribe of Judah, and down all the way to Jesus, who is the king of kings, of course. So this tribe is very special, and every time you read the Old Testament, or every time even you read the New Testament, you see this, this name, this tribe of Israel, of Judah. Um, it's an important one to kind of perk your attention and sit up uh, a little bit taller, uh, because Judah is really important. And uh, the people of Judah are important, especially the, the kings, obviously, and of course, Jesus Christ himself. So if you look here on this map, 
we see this map of Judah. Judah gets this big allotment down um, in the bottom, in the south, uh, uh, south Israel, if you will. Um, and if you know the Old Testament story, you know this is really important because um, the kingdom later splits into two after they have uh, David and Solomon and then Solomon, uh, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and then this guy named Jeroboam, they split the kingdom. Jeroboam takes uh, the northern tribes and he sets up his own kingdom. And then Rehoboam takes the southern tribe and it's just one tribe. It's, it's the tribe of Judah. Uh, so it's the southern kingdom versus the northern kingdom. And uh, so we see the southern kingdom. We see it getting set up. We see uh, the, where the people are supposed to, to settle down. And it's interesting too, if you read... Uh, the last verse, verse 63 of this long uh, chapter, it says, The Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the people of Judah, could not drive them out. So the Jebusites dwell with the people of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. So we see, and I told you this a while ago, but we see the people of Israel not fully uh, satisfy God's um, command for them to drive all of the people out. God intended this land to be 100% Israel's. Uh, not Israel and some Canaanites, but just Israel's. And the people of Israel, the people of Judah here in this case, don't do that. And so they're going to reap the consequences of later on uh, turning to other gods. And uh, that's because they didn't drive the Jebusites out and the other people of the land of Canaan out. Uh, we see a lot of names. We see a lot of cities. We see a lot of uh, things that you probably can't even pronounce, um, which is okay. Uh, but it's important for us to understand that God designed, God intended for the people of Israel, specifically right now the people of Judah, to have this land. And uh, we believe that God's going to restore uh, the, the, the land of Israel one day to the Israelites. Um, but uh, it's important for us to understand, uh, to understand the narrative of the Old Testament. Uh, it's important we understand where the people of Judah were located uh, so it's good stuff here today, even if you didn't understand uh, the language, because it was a different language, a lot of Hebrew uh, words going on, um, but good stuff from Joshua chapter 15. So now let's flip over to the book of Luke. I guarantee you this will make uh, a little bit more sense to you, but Luke chapter 18 is where we are now, and we're going to pick it up in verse 18. So Luke 18, verse 18, and uh, we're going to meet this uh, familiar friend, uh, friend, I don't know, familiar guy, uh, the rich young ruler here. In verse 18. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, What is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, See, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come, eternal life. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them and they did not grasp what was said. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. All right, so we see three little episodes 
uh, from the story of Jesus, from the Gospel of Luke here. The first one is the rich young ruler, and uh, hopefully you know this story. Uh, but this rich young ruler, this guy comes up, asks Jesus, what can I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, uh, you got to follow all the commands. And he's like, oh, I've done all that. And then so Jesus knows this guy and he knows his heart. He knows the idols of his heart, putting money over God. And he says, I want you to sacrifice that for me. I want you to give some money. I want you to sell all your stuff and give money to the poor. And because he uh, trusted in money because he loved money higher than he loved God. He wasn't willing to do that, and he walked away. And Jesus uh, talks to his disciples. He confronts them. Says, "Hey, you know this is this is very serious. What this guy uh, just did. He gives a lesson about uh, rich people entering the kingdom of heaven like a camel through the eye of a needle. Basically, what he's trying to say is it's hard to follow me, and you got to sacrifice everything. And for a rich person, that's a lot that they have to sacrifice." It doesn't mean every rich person needs to sell everything they have and give it to the poor, but it does mean that you got to surrender everything you have and everything you are to Jesus. And uh, important lesson here, an important lesson here um, in Luke chapter 18. And then we see this little episode about Jesus foretelling his death. A couple days ago on Easter Sunday, we looked at Luke 24 when the uh, the angels at the tomb say uh, to those who show up at the tomb, like, hey, you should have known, you should have remembered that Jesus had already said he was going to die. He was going to be uh, given to the hands of sinful men. They were going to crucify him. And then on the third day, he was going to rise. You already knew this was going to happen. We see that right here, Jesus telling his, uh, foretelling his death. Um, and they didn't understand. They didn't remember. Obviously, the disciples didn't remember this uh, when it came time for Easter Sunday. But again, Jesus calls his shots, and that's really important for us to, to uh, understand that Jesus not only rose from the dead, but he said, I'm going to rise from the dead. This is how I'm going to die. Again, proving that he was God, and then the victory over the grave uh, obviously is a victory over death uh, that Jesus uh, conquers, Jesus does, so that you and I can, can conquer death uh, through eternal life. Uh, so again, an important little nuggets right here when Jesus says what's going to happen. He prophesies, he calls his shots, and then he actually fulfills it. And that's uh, the uh, confirmation of a real prophet, of someone who really uh, knows the mind of God. And in this case, he is God, Jesus, the son of God. He is 100% God. He's 100% man. Um, so it's important for us to to understand Jesus in this in this high way and understand his resurrection in its context and obviously his crucifixion in this context. The last thing we read here is Jesus healing a blind beggar because he, he has faith, he trusts Jesus uh, to give him sight, and Jesus does do that and uh, immediately glorifies God. Uh, that's a great picture of Jesus miraculously healing someone and then that person immediately responding with glorifying God. And all the people around him saw this and all the people around him praised God as well. So good stuff from Luke chapter 18. So now let's flip over to the book of Psalms. Psalm 86 is going to be where we're at today. Psalm 86, another great psalm. So let's start here in verse 1. Psalm 86, a prayer of David. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seeks my life, and they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and be put to shame, because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Wow. 
What an awesome psalm for us to read and reflect on and even pray through this morning. Uh, this great uh, confession of David, uh, of his reliance and his trust and his confidence in God and in God's uh, ability to answer his prayers. He says, be gracious to me. I cry out to you, he says in verse uh, number three. Verse one, he says, uh, hear me and answer me. I'm poor and needy. He's ref he is reflecting on his humility before God, that God is the one that is in control. God is the one that can answer these prayers. He can't do it on his own. And so he's confessing his dependence upon God. Um, he declares God is different than any other gods. We see that in verse 8. There's none like you among the gods, O Lord. All the nations have, have, have shall come and worship before you. They shall glorify your name. I love this. I love this psalm, and it's something for us today. Uh, something that I try to do uh, is is use this psalm to uh, to pray. Use this. Filter your prayer requests through the words of this psalm. God wrote these words, and you can use these words to throw them right back at God uh, in, in in a prayer. And uh, something good for you to do today is to declare your dependence upon God and uh, ask Him. Uh, present your requests before him and uh, trust that he will hear. Pray expectantly, uh, not just throwing up, uh, throwing up prayers, you know, just to the ceiling, but throwing up prayers higher than the ceiling to the God that can answer your prayers. Uh, good, a little lesson we have today, a uh, secondhand lesson uh, about uh, about our prayers and about how uh, God hears them and God answers them. So good stuff from Psalm 86 today. And now let's flip over to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs. Chapter 13, looking at verse 9 and 10 here today. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 9 and 10 says, The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. By insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. Uh, we've seen the theme of wisdom play out through the book of Proverbs. We've seen the theme of righteousness play out through uh, the Proverbs. And we see here those who uh, are taking advice advice are, are, are getting wisdom from God they're, they're those uh, pursuing righteousness they they, they rejoice they, they're going to be protected the lamp of the wicked will be put out uh, we see this godliness and this wisdom coming from those who come humbly to God uh, they come righteously and holy before God pursuing good works we, pers we, we see those people come before God in humility and in holiness, and God, he, he grants them th this wisdom. And we know wisdom from our study through the book of James. Wisdom just means applied knowledge, knowing the right thing to do, and then being able to carry out the right thing to do. And that is, by definition, that is what godliness is, knowing the right thing and then being able to do the right thing. Uh, so that's something for us to take away here uh, from the book of Proverbs, pursuing righteousness, pursuing humility before God. Um, and then in turn, getting that wisdom to know how to live uh, through his word, through prayer. Um, so good stuff, encouraging stuff today from the book of Proverbs. So we'll be again, we'll be here again tomorrow for another edition of Every Day in the Word, going through uh, our four different sections of the Bible. I love getting this, this breadth of, of, of different parts of the Bible, wisdom from the Psalms, prayer from the, or wisdom from the Proverbs, prayer from the Psalms. We see the Old Testament people of Israel, obviously, um, through the book of Joshua. And then we see, obviously, the teachings of Jesus in the book of Luke. Just such a great um, four sections of scripture for us to dig into uh, every day. So we'll see you again tomorrow. Hopefully you're able to take these truths that you learned today and uh, you're able to live them out. Um, so good stuff. Uh, but before you leave, make sure you hit that subscribe button. You, you like, uh, you smash that like button. And uh, you hit that notification bell so you don't miss a thing. I've always wanted to say that. Uh, so we'll see you again tomorrow for every day in the Word. Uh, but until then, hopefully you're able to live these truths out today.